Back to the Future the Ride is my favorite theme park attraction of all time. The ride combined cutting edge special effects, a great movie franchise in Back to the Future, an awesome ride story, heavy involvement from most of the original major cast members, and the ride introduced a motion simulator system that would set the foundation for most motion simulators that would follow. At the time of its development, it had to be by far the best motion simulator in its class. All of these reasons combined with the fact that I always grew up wanting to be Marty McFly helped put this ride at the top of my all-time attraction list. This ride single-handedly cemented Universal as my favorite theme park operator, and as you can probably imagine, I was pretty devastated with this ride's closure. Putting that aside for now, there are some secrets and fun facts that most don't know about this attraction. In this video, let's dive into my five favorite Back to the Future the Ride secrets. Number 5. Heather at the Institute of Future Technology An easy thing to overlook in this ride is Heather, a receptionist at the Institute of Future Technology, immediately recognizable for her orange short sleeve jacket. The Institute of Future Technology is where the ride and queue of this ride take place. This is Doc Brown's official research center for time travel, which apparently is now operating in the public eye. Back to Heather, though, she is an employee who should look pretty darn familiar. Heather appears at a few different points along the queue, but she has her most notable appearance, giving the official safety video just moments before boarding the ride. Heather should look familiar to you because she is played by actress Darlene Vogel, who appeared as Spike O'Malley in Back to the Future 2. Spike is famous for asking Marty Jr. What's wrong, McFly? Uh -oh. You got no scrope? So, obviously, we have some timeline issues here as Back to the Future Part 2 takes place in 2015, and the Institute of Future Technology is supposedly set in the year 1991. Fan theory likes to point towards the fact that maybe Heather is Spike's mom in the Back to the Future universe. In my opinion, this is a bit of a stretch, and I think the makers of the Back to the Future ride were just looking for more ways to represent the series with familiar actors and not much thought was given to legitimate continuation or a story. So there you have it. Darlene Vogel played both Spike in Back to the Future 2 and Heather in Back to the Future The Ride. Number four, the doc can dance? One of my favorite scenes in Back to the Future 3 is when Marty with a completely puzzled look on his face exclaims, Funny boy. The doc can dance. Marty uttered this phrase immediately upon realizing that not only does Doc potentially have a first love interest and girlfriend in Clara Clayton, the Doc that he knew as a pretty antisocial and introvert scientist could also dance. Pretty shocking to say the least. Well, as it turns out, it might not just be the Doc who was a ladies man. According to Christopher Lloyd, who played Doc Brown, he had his own unique experience with this ride. And it didn't really involve time travel. Take a listen. Fourth ride. I started flirting with my wife of the time. Uh, and it, 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 got, <laughs> it, it got kind of playful. <laughs> so you're making out with your wife on the ride? A little, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, the doc turned this ride into his own makeout spot. A funny story, and I felt it was very deserving of a fun fact. Staying on the topic of cast experiences with this ride, Tom Wilson, who plays the main antagonist Biff, he can't stand riding this attraction without getting sick. Kind of ironic seeing as though he is the menacing figure that this ride's entire storyline seeks to take down. I guess all we had to do was put him on the ride and he'll get I'm sick. throw up on a sick kid. <laughs> and I mean, I did the ride about four times in a row and I just said, <laughs> I have to go home now. <laughs> Number three, back to the Star Tours? Longtime followers of this ride know about the history of this attraction and how it ties to Disney's motion simulator of the time, Star Tours. This can be looked at as another example of Universal Studios vs. Disney, but in my opinion, this ride was more about Steven Spielberg vs. George Lucas. During the initial planning of this ride, it was suggested that a roller coaster Back to the Future ride would send thrill seekers to Universal Studios and deliver upon a segment that Disney currently wasn't marketing towards. During the major development era of Universal Studios, Steven Spielberg was one of the biggest consultors of the park. 
As the story goes, in late 1986, Spielberg had just taken a ride on Star Tours. He was beyond impressed with how Disney presented and delivered a motion simulator with a video experience to match. To throw salt in the wound, George Lucas mentioned to Steven how Universal could never build an attraction to the level of Star Tours. Universal creative executive Peter Alexander took these words to heart and immediately got to work with the goal in mind that Universal could deliver an experience that was even better than Star Tours. Steven Spielberg recommended that Universal take a look at the Back to the Future film. This was still a brand new IP that only released the year before. Putting this movie up against a more well-established Star Wars would be risky, but ultimately paid off in the end for Universal Studios. So there you have it. If it wasn't for Disney and George Lucas, this may have been a roller coaster. While some of you may be scoffing at this point, as Universal is a park that desperately needs physical attractions, just remember that there is no guarantee that a coaster built in the late 80s would have been better than what we ultimately received. Fans of the movie series had just watched in amazement as skateboards and cars flew before their eyes in the film sequel. If Universal wanted to put riders into a flying DeLorean, as most fans probably clamored for, this was the way to do it at the time, in my opinion. It was gracefully done, and it was, in fact, better than Star Tours at the time. So, take that, George. Number two, where's Michael? One of the most recognizable facts about this ride is that this ride is missing the main character of the franchise. Although this ride turned out to be an exceptional experience, one can't help but wonder how much better, or perhaps even worse, this attraction would have been if Michael J. Fox was a part of the story. Michael J. was asked to reprise his role of Marty McFly, but unfortunately, or maybe it is fortunate given the fact we still received a great ride, he did in fact turn down this role. Not much is said as to why, but Michael has never expressed ill will towards the series or his character. To this day, even in his condition, he makes occasional appearances at fan conventions and he still loves signing merchandise and appearing as Marty McFly. Personally, I'm not sure why he turned it down. Perhaps he felt he was larger than life at this time and maybe he felt that his time was best suited elsewhere instead of a Universal Studios ride. I'm not sure, it's all speculation. As a fan, I wish that I saw more of him on this ride, but if I'm also being honest, Doc, the DeLorean, and Biff held down the fort just well enough where you didn't really have time to stop and miss Marty. This is something that some other attractions have struggled with without their star, but in my opinion, Back to the Future of the Ride handled this very well. Michael J. Fox still appeared at the opening of this ride in Hollywood and in Florida, so even though he wasn't officially involved with the ride scenes, he was still very much involved with celebrations and being around the park as this ride was being presented. Kind of strange. I'm not sure if I will ever fully understand why he didn't come back, but I'm sure there might be a small piece of him that wishes he took more part. If you are missing your fill of Marty McFly in this attraction, he was still seen in small portions of the queue utilizing archived footage from the filming of the movies. Just nothing new for the ride. Number one, watch out for the styrofoam cup. As I have mentioned many times throughout the course of this video, this ride was a complete marvel and was truly ahead of its time. This ride was shot on film by major special effects operators and even used real miniature models to portray each scene. Trying to figure out how to pull off this illusion of flight on a massive IMAX dome screen without distortion is not an easy task. This is a problem that theme parks still deal with to this day and footage from Disney soaring around the world was highly criticized for its sloped and crooked Eiffel Tower. Keep in mind, Soarin' Around the World opened in 2016. Back to the Future the ride opened in 1991. This should show you just how ahead of their time the makers of the Back to the Future the ride had to operate. Now, since everything was shot on film and was actually even physically built, this left room for a few errors. In recent memory, there was a Starbucks cup left in a Game of Thrones scene, and well, this is a problem that has also plagued the Back to the Future ride. When so many different workers are working on a project, sometimes it can become an issue to keep handle on everyone's personal belongings. In the Back to the Future of the ride, as the vehicle is about to crash into the clock tower, if you look to the right, there is a large styrofoam cup that can be seen. Ironically, because everything is miniature models, the cup appears to be about a full story tall. This is a mistake that I'm sure the makers of this ride weren't happy about when production was wrapped. 
So that's going to do it for everything that we have for you guys today. Please stay tuned to the channel as we will have a lot more for you on the way. If you haven't subscribed, don't forget to hit that subscribe button right now and turn on the bell to be in the loop on everything that we have for you on the way. You'll be the first to know as soon as we get these videos out and it gives you a chance to be in the Fast 15 comments for future giveaways. All you have to do is make any comment in the first 15 minutes of our next upload and you are automatically eligible for all of our weekly giveaways of theme park memorabilia and theme park shark items. We'd love to know your thoughts on the video and maybe even something that you recognize that I didn't touch on. Feel free to go ahead and throw that down below and I'll do my best to get back to each and every one of you. But alright guys, that'll do it for now. I'll see all of you in the next one. Peace.